Um, so I want to talk today, as Ali said, about my new book um, with my colleague Daniel Lorison, um, which really looks at social mobility um, both into but also within Britain's top occupations. Um, and the motivation for this work uh, was really quite simple. We wanted to address a conceptual problem that we felt had hampered social mobility research for some time. And that's really that nearly all of those working in this area, especially quantitatively, tend to follow the lead of John Goldthorpe at Oxford in calculating social mobility in a particular way, by measuring the distance between people's class origins and destinations in large class occupational schemas like the NSEC in the UK, EGP scheme abroad, and then engage in sort of endless discussions um, uh, examining whether mobility in national terms normally is decreasing uh, or increasing. And what that's meant is that we have a, a large body of very important data and analysis on mobility into large categories of occupation, big class categories if you will, and we've been able to answer really important questions about social change. But it's also led to two problems in our minds. First, it means that we actually know fairly little about differences in mobility between occupations, particularly elite or prestigious occupations. Is law more open than academia, for example? And this was actually a key concern in sociology in the 60s and 70s uh, for people like Anthony Giddens when he was working here. But actually, that sort of agenda has very much disappeared. Secondly, perhaps even more importantly for today, this dominant approach has meant that the conceptualization of social mobility has been tied to this idea of access, okay? Who gets into the top jobs or top organizations? How does that relate to their background? Now, clearly, occupational entry is important, but at the same time, fairly simply, getting in doesn't necessarily mean getting on. And the problem with this sort of fair access agenda is that it tends to ignore differences in people's resources that they bring with them into the workplace, as well as the different rewards they reap once there. So following this kind of logic, um, our project really wanted to advance a new way of looking at social mobility. In particular, we had three key research questions. <coughs> First, we simply asked, as I mentioned, what is the relative social exclusivity of different elite occupations in Britain? And here we're defining elite occupations largely as the top class of Britain's uh, main socioeconomic classification, which is higher managerial, administrative, and professional occupations. That's people like CEOs, professors, doctors, etc. We also wanted to include a set of cultural professions like journalism, um, uh, art, um, acting, uh, film, and television. And that's really that we felt that these sort of occupations are uh, as, if not more, competitive than many of the traditional professions, as well as wielding a sort of outsized cultural influence. Secondly, we wanted to move beyond this idea of occupational access. Specifically, we wanted to look at how the upwardly fair, upwardly mobile fair, once they've entered these occupations, do they attain the same levels of earnings, for example, as those from more privileged backgrounds? Now, obviously, the answer to this question is no, otherwise we wouldn't have a book contract. So third, what I want to spend most of today answering and exploring is the question of, of why. What might be driving this class ceiling? This is the data that we're drawing on quantitatively here. It's an unprecedentedly large sample of over 100,000 people in Britain's <laughs> largest employment survey, the Labour Force Survey. <coughs> which really allows us to dig for the first time into mobility um, in specific elite occupations with real empirical authority. Also very important to talk about what do we actually mean by social mobility. This tends to generate a lot of the questions in these sorts of discussions and I'm happy to have them. There is no undisputed way to measure social mobility, but we're drawing on the most established quantitative approach here, which is which takes a survey question which asks people what is or what was the main occupation what was the occupation of the main breadwinner in your household when you were 14 and based on answers to that question we condense people's class origins 
into the three groups that you can see up there. First, um, those whose parents did professional and managerial work. We often think of these as sort of upper middle class or middle class jobs. Second, those whose parents did intermediate or skilled manual jobs, shop owners, electricians, what we perhaps talk about in everyday life as lower middle class jobs. And finally, those whose parents did solidly working class routine jobs, cleaners, labourers, or who were unemployed. I should also say, though, that although we use this measure of class origins um, in the quantitative part of the book, it's really for pragmatic reasons. We think parental occupation is probably the best single indicator of class origins we have at our disposal, but we're personally, as sociologists, more influenced by Bourdieu, and therefore I'll tell you a little bit more about the interview qualitative component of the project, uh, where we had much more space to probe people's class origins and where we actually employed a more Bourdieusian approach, spending about half an hour with each interviewee, digging into the degree of cultural and economic capital that each interviewee had uh, inherited from their parents. Okay, so this is what the overall flows of origins and destinations look like in the contemporary UK workforce. Mm -hmm. And these people here in the top right are what we're most interested in today. People who have made it into these elite occupations. And I suppose we're particularly interested in the travails of this thin sliver um, representing uh, about 10% of those from working class backgrounds in the UK who make it against the odds into these occupations. But as I mentioned, we wanted to break this down further and we had the ability to do so. So I hope you can see this here. This is showing you how class background affects access into a range of professional groups um, in terms of those <coughs> three origin groups um, and how they reflect the composition of that occupation. Now, the main thing I want you to take away from this slide is really the diversity of backgrounds in these different professions. From the traditional professions like medicine, where only 6% of people are from working class backgrounds, to more technical professions like engineering and IT, where actually the majority are not from middle or upper middle class backgrounds. Now, some of this can be explained by what's called micro class reproduction, the ad advantages enjoyed by those who follow directly in their parents' footsteps. So if you have a parent who is a doctor, you are a somewhat staggering 24 times more likely to become a doctor yourself. Similarly, the children of lawyers are 17 times more likely to go into law, and the children of those in film and television 12 times more likely to go into these fields. But while this demonstrates variation in the openness of different professions, it can't tell us about how those from different origins fare once inside. So <coughs> here we get at that using, very simply, people's earnings in elite occupations as a whole. Average annual earnings. And what this shows fairly straightforwardly um, is that those from working class backgrounds face a very significant class pay gap. About £6,400 a year, 16% compared to colleagues from professional and managerial backgrounds. And this gap is particularly marked for certain social groups. So here, for example, you can see quite clearly that women from working class backgrounds face a double disadvantage. They earn nearly £19,000 a year less than male colleagues from privileged backgrounds in that elite occupational grouping as a whole. A similar double disadvantage is evident when looking at most socially mobile black and minority ethnic individuals or professionals. You can see the purple lines here for nearly every, not all, but nearly every ethnic minority group are lower than that of socially mobile white individuals. Although I should say here, um, I recognise that these in and of themselves are slightly problematic amalgamated ethnic categories here. And the slightly depressing reason for that is that even in a huge data set um, as big as this, the numbers for individual ethnic groups in elite occupations are still so small um, that we needed to construct these crude, somewhat crude categories in order to have the statistical power to look at them in any depth. We also looked at individual elite occupations. And again, you see very significant variation here. Some occupations like architecture um, and engineering have no discernible class pay gaps. Whereas, as you can see, the worst offenders here 
Places like finance, medicine, law, and accountancy have really very striking class pay gaps. But of course, the simple distribution of averages can't really tell us whether people from socially mobile backgrounds face a kind of class ceiling. Many of you perhaps have already started formulating your own explanations for the class pay gap that I've shown you here. Maybe working class people are simply younger on average than those from privileged backgrounds and therefore they're just less far along in their careers. Perhaps the privileged have higher rates of educational attainment. Maybe they just work harder or they perform better at work. These are mechanisms that we wanted to interrogate. So we used something called uh, regression analysis on earnings among those in these top jobs and then we controlled for a whole set of factors thought to affect earnings. Okay? And some of the things that I just mentioned are part of the story here. Education, for example, does explain some of the gap. Those from privileged backgrounds tend to have higher qualifications and attend more prestigious universities, both of which, associ both of which are associated with higher earnings. Yet significantly, and perhaps of interest to you guys, even Oxbridge, okay, supposedly, well you guys can tell me, the ultimate sorting houses of academic ability, uh, do not wash away the advantages of class origin. Graduates from privileged backgrounds still go on to earn about £5,000 a year more than their working class peers at Oxbridge. Other important mechanisms are also at work here. The privileged are more likely to work in London, they're more likely to work in large firms, and they're more likely to work in certain professions, like I showed you there, like finance, all of which are associated with higher pay. Although for me, those are not sort of meritocratic or innocent factors. We know from the work of people like Louise Ashley in the UK, Lauren Rivera in the US, getting into big firms um, in certain types of professions um, come with a whole set of class barriers for working class candidates. But most importantly, even when we adjust for all of these factors, along with demographics, and also a range of conventional indicators of merit or human capital, how many hours somebody works, their level of training, the amount of experience they have, still half the class pay gap remains. So this is really worth underlining, I think. Even when those from working class backgrounds are similar to their advantaged colleagues in every way we can measure in Britain's largest employment survey, they still earn significantly less. So the question then is why? Getting at this um, is really what the last couple of years have been, um, what we've been devoting our time to, something that we felt required going beyond large-scale survey data. So we brokered access to a number of elite firms. We went behind the closed doors at a large multinational accountancy firm, a successful architecture practice, and one of Britain's biggest television channels. We also wanted to look at life outside of firms, so we spoke to self-employed actors. Now these case studies involved a lot of field work, um, some observation of interviews, <coughs> promotion panels, but pivoted mainly around 175 interviews conducted with employees from different <coughs> backgrounds and at different grades across these case studies. In each case though, in each field work site, we actually began with a kind of x-ray of the firm, examining the class composition of staff. And this was actually really revealing. It showed us that the class pay gap is less an issue of equal pay for equal work and more about what might call sorting, the sorting of the socially mobile horizontally into less prestigious departments and vertically into lower tiers or positions. Now just to give you one example of this, this is our TV channel, I can actually name them here um, as Channel 4 because bravely um, and I think encouragingly in terms of the public agenda around this stuff, they recently decided to publish this research. They subsequently got savaged in the media for doing so, um, and I think you can see why. There's a very clear class ceiling at Channel 4. Those from working class backgrounds are not only hugely underrepresented in the first place, um, but drop off sharply as you move up the channel. And one of the things driving this is departmental sorting within the channel. So you can see here that the most exclusive area of Channel 4 is commissioning. Not only the creative hub and probably the most prestigious area, but also, crucially, the department that holds 
the most sort of senior management positions and the sort of gateways to those positions. So how do we account for these kinds of filtering or ceiling effects? This is really what most of the book is devoted to looking at. Um, but what I want to try and do now is briefly pull out four drivers that emerged from across the case studies uh, and which we explore uh, in the book in detail. And what I want to try and do is <coughs> narrate these drivers through the lens of one interviewee in particular. This interviewee was Mark. Mark was a senior commissioner at Channel 4. He was from a very privileged background. His parents were successful professionals. He was educated at one of the country's top private schools um, and he had gone on to Oxford. Of course, this isn't his real name, uh, <laughs> if you were wanting to look him up. Um, now, Mark undoubtedly had one of the most coveted jobs in British television. He controlled a budget extending to the tens of millions, and every day a steady stream of independent television producers arrived at his desk, desperate to land a pitch. At 39, he was really quite young to wield such power. Certainly, he'd enjoyed a swift ascension. He had initially become... Uh, he, after making his name as a programme maker, he had initially um, become a commissioner, a rival broadcaster, before being headhunted by Channel 4 some five years ago. A string of hits later, and, and really Mark was seen by many that I spoke to as one of the biggest players, not only at the channel, but in the industry. Yet when we met Mark, uh, on the top of Channel 4's futuristic aluminium and glass-clad headquarters, and invited him to narrate his career in his own words, a very different account emerged. <coughs> he acknowledged, of course, that he had certain objective merits, okay? Prestigious educational credentials, a strong work ethic, even certain skills, an eye for narrative, he said, or a knack for what he called idea generation. But the most crucial thing, he told us, was that his talents were given a platform, a chance to develop, as he put it, or later, an opportunity to shine. And central in this platform, or supplying this platform, he told us were his parents, who for over five years had provided a financial safety net that had tided him over when he was jockeying for his first sort of permanent contract as a television producer. And really this kind of early career investment from the bank of mum and dad was echoed across our interviews, particularly among those working in the culture and creative industries, and particularly among those uh, from privileged backgrounds. What we found was that this kind of financial cushion acted as a sort of pivotal layer of insulation from the uncertainty associated with forging a career, both in terms of negotiating the cost of living um, in places like London, where most of the best opportunities are clustered, but also more psychologically in terms of engendering a sense that one can take more risks in their career, spend more time on networking, or take more uncertain or short-term roles, all of which may have long-term payoffs for someone's career. In contrast, those who lack family money describe the day-to-day -day reality of making a living in these kind of areas as a kind of economic chaos, or as this actor Ray aptly put it, like skydiving without a parachute. And more broadly, what we found was, was that in the face of this economic uncertainty, many from working-class backgrounds <coughs> had decided to sort of grudgingly self-select out of the most competitive or prestigious areas of their profession, their creative route in television, advisory and accountancy. And what they've chosen is more stable, but considerably less prestigious and lucrative roles elsewhere in their industries, in admin, in sales, in marketing, for example. But it wasn't just about money. More significant for Mark's accelerated trajectory, for example, were a handful of senior colleagues who, he explained, had sort of taken him under their wing early in his career and often, and this is crucial, operate, operating beneath formal <coughs> mechanisms, had fast-tracked his career, facilitating jobs, uh, allocating valuable work or advocating on his behalf. He told us here, it's interesting, I, could, I mean, I could almost give you my whole trajectory and sponsors because it's sort of, it's quite medieval in television. You serve apprenticeships and you have a patron. Now, this type of sponsorship was actually particularly common at our accountancy firm, where most partners actually talked openly about this idea of bringing through the next generation of partners. And while this was 
largely presented as an innocent process of talent spotting, we found that sponsor relationships were rarely established initially on the basis of work performance. Instead, they were almost always forged, in the first instance at least, on a sort of cultural affinity, on people who uh, feel familiar, as this quote shows you quite clearly, who one recognises, who one feels comfortable with. And I suppose the point is that as senior managers across these case studies, as I showed you, are overwhelmingly from privileged backgrounds themselves, and it was the same at the accountancy firm, this type of sponsorship in one's own image then tends to act as another form of advantage for the already privileged. Back to Mark. Um, perhaps more pivotal to his extent, ascent, he went on to tell us, was an ability to, in his words, fit in with the telly tribe. This meant things like dress, he said, and promptly pointed to his pristine white and expensive looking trainers. He said, I don't know why I wear these. I suppose it's a uniform, isn't it? Just like a businessman wears a suit. Questions of fit became even more powerful, he said, as he had entered the upper echelons of television commissions. Vital here, he noted, was a sense of how to perform in certain work environments, particularly in the kind of collaborative and creative decision-making settings common to television. And here Mark made an explicit link between what he called the rules of the game in television and the specificities of his own class background. Let me give you an example, he said, recording a period on the senior production team of a news programme. So every day we had this morning meeting where we decided what stories to do and everyone pitched in on what their angle should be. And it was instantly recognisable to me, exactly like the common rooms I'd encountered at Oxford and at school. The rules were it's good to be right, but it's better to be funny. Now these curious and fairly opaque behavioural codes were reiterated across our interviews at Channel 4. They constituted a powerful sense of what we called studied informality. And there were two sort of key dimensions of this idea. First, a particular package of self-presentation, an RP accent, a casual but hip dress. It wasn't only Mark, there was a lot of discussion about the right kind of trainers to wear in television. <laughs> uh, a knowing, often ironic humour. Who knows when to swear in meetings? Who knows when to put their feet up? Who knows when to mock their managers? This came up a lot. And also a level of interpersonal familiarity, hugs and kisses rather than handshakes that you don't normally associate with the professional workplace. Second, it also involved a particular way of talking about television, a particular sort of highbrow or intellectual mode of discussing television, particularly, of course, in commissioning, where there was this sense that people were um, dropping cultural references often from other high art forms or speaking in a particular sort of arcane or lyrical tone. And the point here was that Many, like this interviewee, who's actually from a fairly privileged background, told us in an anonymous interview that actually this kind of reference dropping was quite irrelevant to the types of programmes being made at this mainstream producer channel. Why are we talking about the great American novel in relation to a programme about lie detectors? She says here. And unsurprisingly, it was those from working class backgrounds particularly women and minority ethnic individuals, that found these codes particularly alienating, <coughs> intimidating, who struggled to master studied informality, who, in the words of Claire here, constantly feel like they're imposters, like everyone else intimately knows one another, even if they know they don't. Now, these kind of codes might seem um, fairly superficial. What we would argue, though, is that, and we do across two chapters in the book, that they're in many ways the most important single driver of the class ceiling. Why is this? Well, I think we often think about merit as sort of having a, 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 a fixed nature. Um, that most indicators in the workplace are sort of um, objectively measurable uh, and equally recognised by all. A key theme, I think, running through our analysis is that supposedly objective measures of merit in the workplace are often actually received, assessed and valued very differently according to how they're performed. Some performances fit, in other words, and others do not. And in many professions, this is really about the historical legacy of an overwhelmingly privileged white male majority who have been able to embed, even institutionalise, their own ideas about the right way to work and to be in the workplace. 
And this is largely expressed, we found in interviews, as a sort of gut feeling, an intuitive sense, as one of the partners at the accountancy firm put it, that some people simply feel like a partner. Our book is sort of peppered with these examples of kind of what Bourdieu would call doxic, taken for granted notions of merit. Whether it might be studied informality in television, as I noticed, the idea of corporate polish in, tele in accountancy, or the enduring power of RP pronunciation in acting. While different in important ways, these codes all sort of pivot on a particular package of self-presentation relating to dress, accent, taste, language, etiquette that are strongly associated with a privileged upbringing, what Bourdieu calls embodied cultural capital. And while some may argue, and interestingly, the columnist Claire Fogues writing about our book in the Times last week, um, noted that these behavioural codes are actually sort of intrinsically desirable. She said that those from working class backgrounds should just emulate them, that they, should, that they just need to, and I quote her here, speak properly, clearly and crisply. <laughs> I think what we would counter to that is that actually in most cases these behavioural codes are fairly arbitrary. That they can't be reliably pegged to any credible measure of work performance, ability or intelligence. But we certainly would challenge people to explain to us how they are. And further, we tend to think that they are particularly important in certain work environments. I mentioned commissioning and TV. We also found similar sorts of processes in advisory and accountancy. Here, performance is arguably especially hard to evaluate. Notions of merit are particularly uncertain and contestable. In these environments, the success of the final product financial advice, television program, is kind of hard to foretell. And therefore the knowledge and the expertise of the professional is arguably inherently ambiguous. So presenting or performing the right image then, when advising a client or pitching a program, becomes integral as an act of persuasion, a proxy for a competence that can't be reliably or definitively demonstrated in the moment. Now you may have noticed so far we've completely ignored one of our case studies, that was uh, Architecture Practice Coopers. The reason for that is that, as you can see here, although it's a bit messy because it was a fairly small practice, we didn't really find a class ceiling effect. In fact, some of the partners at this uh, architecture practice were actually from uh, working class backgrounds, quite clearly. So we we're trying to think, well, how do we explain the difference um, that we saw in this one um, case study. I don't have time to go into this in the sort of detail I'd like to, and I should say that I think it was a smaller practice and I think we feel slightly less um, authoritative about what we're saying here. But one of our tentative explanations is it's partly to do with the types of behaviours and skills that are valued by gatekeepers at the top of this firm. So I believe it can be more transparently learned, amassed, and actually evaluated in the labour market. I would be very careful to say that we're not in any way trying to argue that technical expertise doesn't have a performed dimension. This architecture practice, um, you'd probably be unsurprised to hear, was massively gendered. None of the 13 partners were women. So the ability to sort of land technical capital um, certainly has something to do with who is presenting it in terms of gender. But our overarching point, I think, is that environments that seem to more strongly value um, technical expertise, even if the work itself is hard to discern as being more or less technical, but where it's valued more, not just at Coopers, but also in certain departments at our other case study firms, tax at the accountancy firm, strategy at Channel 4, there appear to be smaller class ceiling effects, particularly for men. So far, we've sort of interrogated um, what you might call sort of barriers that hold the upwardly mobile back. But what about them themselves? What about their actions, their aspirations, their decisions? Um, I think we did find some evidence that these people had sometimes not pushed forward in their career in the ways you might expect, considering their sort of credentials, considering their experience um, uh, and performance and skills. 
But I think we would st strongly challenge the idea, uh, popular in discussions um, uh, in policy in the UK around social mobility, that this points to some sort of intrinsic differences in confidence or in character, as <coughs> Damien Hines has been putting it recently, uh, or aspiration. Instead, I think what we were seeing is that the upwardly mobile often commit acts of what um, you might call self-elimination uh, in elite occupations, and often in anticipation of the kinds of barriers that we've already outlined. Now, this manifested in various ways, but one theme that came up with many who had actually done very well was that once in executive settings, they found themselves sort of unwilling or unable to play by the rules and push for the very top. And I just want to give you one example of this. This is Bill. Bill was a commissioner at Channel 4. And he explained that as his career had developed, and particularly in the pursuit of becoming a commissioner, he'd engaged in a fairly intricate process of cultural mimicry. He'd changed his accent. He had uh, decided never to talk about his background. Uh, and he had generally sort of imitated the highbrow culture that I'd outlined earlier. But as he explains in this really lucid quote, which I, I hope you can see there, <coughs> Reaching the very top in television, he's sort of intimating here, is often contingent on assimilation, not just in one's professional life, but also in their personal lives, of sort of fully embracing the clubbable aspects of the profession. But for Bill, extending this performance into his social and personal life is kind of a step too far. It's one that he's sort of arguing here requires a sort of existential betrayal of everything that he describes as real and important. In this way, Bill, like many that we spoke to, underlined the sort of limits of class cultural assimilation. But I think what's significant is that this isn't enforced by others, necessarily. It's the result here of Bill's own reluctance to sort of embrace full-blown identity mutation. Mark, in contrast, had no such existential issues. His career had proceeded at both a tremendous speed and an enviable smoothness. But what was interesting and unusual about Mark was his acknowledgement that, in many ways, this upward trajectory had been contingent on starting the race with a series of profound advantages. <clears throat> I think this quote is really um, telling. He says, it's not like I think I'm rubbish. I mean, I've seen lots of peers with greater networks and privilege screw up because they just weren't good enough. But at the same time, it's sort of mad to pretend there's not been an incredibly strong following wind throughout my career. So this idea of a following wind, a gust of privilege, if you will, gets really to the heart of what our book is about. It neatly captures, we think, the sort of subtle propulsive power provided by an advantaged class background. How it acts as an energy-saving device that allows some to get further with less effort, deftly shaping career trajectories, delineating what courses of action are possible, what kind of support is available, and how one's merits are perceived by others. Equally, the metaphor sort of visualises the experiences of the upwardly mobile, who very often feel like they have the wind against them. It's not that such individuals can't move forward or never reach the top, just that generally it takes longer, happens less frequently, and often represents a markedly more labour-intensive, even exhausting experience. And I suppose the key point to underline is that when the following wind of privilege is kind of misread as merit, the inequalities that result are legitimised. <coughs> But why does this matter for sociology? <clears throat> well, we think this has implications um, fairly self-evidently around how we think about social class. Most research on social mobility, as I mentioned at the beginning, proceeds with the presumption that once a class destination in the form of entry to a particular occupation has been achieved, class origins sort of ceases to matter. We don't necessarily think that's what those sociologists think in reality, but the kinds of um, measurements, um, tools that they use, have that implication built into them. I think what our analysis here is showing is that class origin is deeply sticky. The resources that flow from our backgrounds often shape our careers well beyond occupational entry. Second, um, I think what we're also sort of tentatively getting at here is the idea that class origin matters more in some areas of the labour market than others. And I think here our analysis points to the importance of different forms of knowledge, different forms of merit across different <coughs> occupations, and how those are implicated in the openness of these jobs. 
And I suppose what we think we're seeing here is that in elite occupations where notions of merit or demonstrable expertise are more ambiguous, harder to evaluate, um, such as TV commissioning or, or advisory, as I mentioned, the sort of cultural trappings of a privileged class background appear to provide more concrete advantages. Here, under conditions of heightened ambiguity, the class performance of merit is imbued with an elevated currency. Third and very finally, um, we would tentatively add that our analysis may also be useful to those working outside of class, um, hopefully scholars of gender and ethnicity in particular. Um, our work is the first that we know of, anyway, that shows systematic intersections um, between class, gender and ethnicity in terms of pay inequality, quantitatively. And while we in no way intend to suggest that this is the revival of class as some sort of master category, um, I suppose what our hope is that um, future work on glass ceilings uh, and pay gaps may yield sort of further intersectional insight by taking class origin into account. Thank you.